Keith Lay, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of September 20th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. Also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we look at how much of the FY22 budget is being paid for by PFD cuts. We think it will shock most. Second, we discuss the public abandonment by the House Ways and Means Committee Chair of the efforts of the Comprehensive Fiscal Working Group. And third, we update on some recent significant developments in the global LNG market and on the AK LNG board. And now, let's join Michael. Let's crack things off here, uh, Brad. We've got... Um uh, you know, we've got the weekly top three, which we're about to dive into, and there's some, I mean, there's some, uh, you know, good news, bad news, and just kind of real, real news as to what's going on. Let's, uh, let's take a crack at this and start things off. Number one, where do we stand now that the third special, special, special session is over? Where, where do we start? I've started doing some analysis that uh, that you will never hear from Senate Finance or House Finance, uh, but that I find useful and and enlightening about what's uh, what's going on. I pieced together the the budget um, that the that we, where we stand now at the end of the at the end of the third special session where we stand on the FY22 budget, and looked at the source, sources of funding. Now we all hear a lot about how you know. Uh, oil oil is down as a revenue source, and so you know the biggest source of funds is the um, is the draw from the uh, from the permanent fund, uh, and now we're in investment state uh, instead of an oil state. Um, we're, we're a trust fund baby state as right. opposed to uh, as opposed to an oil state. But that really hides. I mean, that's the that's the theme you hear out of out of Senate Finance and House Finance. But that really hides. Uh, what's going on. So I dove into it and I broke out how much of the funding is coming from PFD cuts, um, looking inside the POMV draw and saying, okay, how much of that statutorily is supposed to be for the PFD um, and how much of that got diverted to government um, instead of going out uh, in accordance with the statute. And um, I did a chart that uh, that is on the Facebook page that uh, that people can go look at, but I find it fascinating. The biggest source of funds, biggest source of funds for the FY22 budget is PFD cuts. 38% of the FY22 budget is being funded through PFD cuts. The next largest is uh, traditional revenues, oil and uh, and the the accumulation of taxes, uh, corporate and, and other taxes and, and fees that we've developed over time, that comes in at 35%. But the biggest source of funds, biggest source of funds, is PFD cuts, uh, and that's just that's just fascinating to me. I mean, you will never hear that out of Senate Finance. You will never hear that out of House Finance. I'm surprised you don't hear out of it hear about it from the governor, but maybe he has his own reasons not to want to talk about it. But the biggest source of funds that, that we're using to fund the FY22 budget is coming on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families uh, through PFD cuts. In the chart I did, and the chart you can find on the, on the Facebook page, I then broke down uh, what that means in terms, of, in terms of the take 
from uh, from various uh, from the various income brackets, uh, comparing it to the statutory uh, uh, PFD, what people would get if the if we complied with the statute, we're taking 25 percent of the income from low income, the lowest 20 percent of Alaska families. Right. 12 percent from the lower middle, the next 20 percent. Nine percent from the middle income Alaska families. Six percent, five point seven percent, six percent rounded from upper upper middle in uh, upper middle income Alaska families. What we're taking to fund government from the top one percent is zero point seven percent. Less than one percent of their income is going to income is is going to is going to uh, to fund government. So clearly, what we've done, clearly what the legislature is doing is deciding that we're going to we're going to continue to fund the government we have we're going to fund it uh through pfd cuts largely through pfd cuts 38 percent of it's coming from pfd cuts and we're going to shift it on by using pfd cuts we're going to shift that burden on to middle uh and lower income alaska families it's a it, it, it's a way of looking at the budget that i think really brings home how bad a fiscal structure uh, we've set up how distorted, how 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 burdensome a fiscal structure that we we've set up on Alaska families, and it's not only Alaska families as we've talked about on the show, as as Mike Shower would sometimes say ad nauseum, um, as we've talked on the show uh, before, using PFD cuts as the largest adverse effect on the on the Alaska economy of all of the revenue options. So, in the middle of a pandemic. In the middle of a a recession, in the middle of high unemployment, in the middle of a very difficult economic environment, our legislature has chosen to fund nearly 40% of the government by pushing the burden off on middle and lower income Alaska families in a way that has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. I, it's just, you know, I, I, what what can you say at that point? Right. You you you. you you know the legislature is just is just the only the only beneficiaries the only beneficiaries has the largest adverse impact on middle and lower income Alaska families has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. The only beneficiaries of this sort of fiscal structure is the top twenty percent, and the legislature has essentially said in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of a recession, we're going to protect the top twenty percent by making sure that they they don't have to pay. But we're going to and we're going to do that by pushing the burden of middle and lower income Alaska families. It just a, I mean, it's an eye opener to me to do the analysis in that way and to show how much of government is being funded through PFD cuts. Well, and I see two things here. I mean, first of all, that the shocking, the the gap here and the and the, you know, how much is being taxed, the the spread, the spread between the income brackets. I, I find that to be, of course, we've talked about it, but to look at it in graphical form is shocking. And I do have the, uh, I do have the graphic up on the page here for those who are watching on Facebook live, <laughs> you can go see it there. But really, I'll tell you what really shocked me when I first saw this graphic was the, not the distributional analysis of, of who's impacted the most, but the fact that I'm looking at this and the fact that the upper or that the, the, the current budget is funded by nearly 40% of it is funded by PFD cuts. That means 40% of it is coming straight from Alaskans' pockets. And we're crying about how that, you know, we don't want to be taxed in this state. And when you look at it like that, you're like, holy cow, we're currently paying 40% uh, already in this, you know, kind of quasi stealth tax. Um, and they, I mean, that, that doesn't even count the other 14% that they're spending out of savings. They're not, we're not anywhere near balancing this budget. They keep saying how good, how much they're going to, oh yeah, don't worry about it. We got it. We're, we're almost balanced. We could just take it all and be balanced. I mean, they are taxed. That, that, that to me was the most shocking visual in what we had going on here. Yeah, it's uh, it, it is. I mean, it's it's it, it is clear that they're not going to reduce. I mean, we've talked about this on the show again, as Mike Shar would say ad nauseum. But we, we, it's clear they're not going to reduce the size and scope of government. That there's no that there's the lack of will in the legislature to reduce the size and scope of government. Okay, let, let's just accept that for the moment. Then how are you going to fund it? Well, you know, they're, they're hiding how they're funding it by talking about the POMV draw and how the POMV draw, how, how we're so fortunate to have the POMV draw, to, you know, to, to, to fund government. We don't have to we don't have to tax people 
to fund government. Well, that's just bullshit. I mean, <laughs> when when you when you analyze what's going on inside the inside the POMV draw, and you analyze how much of that's being diverted from the PFD, you see they're clearly taxing people, clearly taxing Alaska families, clearly funding it on the back of middle and lower income Alaska families, clearly funding it in the way that has the largest adverse impact on the overall uh, Alaska economy. It, it's just, I mean, this, 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 we're not going to tax people. This, this mantra that, you know, we're going to avoid taxing people is just absolute a crock of, of, it's Bert of whatever Stedman. it is. It's Bert Stedman. Um, it's a, uh, it's a crock of Bert Stedman. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, well, so that's number one. Uh, and I think it's pretty clear. I mean, you can look at these figures, you can see these, Brad, you've got them up on your website, um, and up on the Facebook page, people can, uh, you know, let's let, let's jump into that. Um, but again, how any legislator can look at that and understand, especially after I mean, they talk to they talk to uh, um, uh, they talk to the uh, Alaska Institute for Socioeconomic Research. They talk to them every session. There's somebody from ICER there and they say the same thing over and over again, that the taking of the PFD has the largest economic impact uh, on the economy. Uh, out there and they just continue to ignore it at some point you've got to realize that it's not just oh we think we know better it's just that they don't they just don't even care at this point michael it's it's a little bit more than than we don't care it's a it's it's more we're going to protect the top 20 percent you yes we know that we're taxing alaska families yes we know that that we're doing it in a way that has the largest adverse impact so why are you doing it that way well we just don't want to tax the top 20 percent and and we figured out this neat way through using PFD cuts. We we figured out this neat way where we don't have to do it, and and so we don't have to we don't have to face up to our our donors. I mean, the top twenty percent is largely the donor class. We don't have to face up to our our, our peers when we go home, and and say you know we're going to have to tax you. They found out they found this neat way to slide the burden off on middle and lower income Alaska families, and it's just grown and grown and grown. We. We did a chart last last week, uh, I think it was, or maybe the week before, where where we showed the growth of dependence on PFD cuts, on that source of revenue, that source of funding uh, to fund the government. It's just grown and grown and grown. Um, and and you know they go home and the top twenty percent say, "Good on you, you you managed to to avoid taxes." Well, <laughs> yeah, they avoid taxes on the top twenty percent, but look what's happening. Right. It's just the, the burden is growing and growing and growing on middle and lower income Alaska. Families. You'd like to think that people are just, oh, they just think that they're doing the right thing and that they care and everything else. But in the end, it's all about protecting government. I mean, that's really what it's all. It's about protecting government uh, and all those constituencies and maintaining power. Oh, and if we can pass it off to the little guy, then uh, there you go. You know, that's that 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 checks all the boxes for them, it seems like. You know, one of the things that really upset me this last, it, it, toward the end of the last session, was David Wilson in Senate Finance saying, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to oppose taxes. I'm not going to, you know, uh, support taxes to, uh, uh, to, you know, pay for government. I'm going to, I'm going to hold the line there. Well, David, look at this. You're already supporting taxes. The, the legislature's already supporting taxes. It just happens to be on ta taxes on people that aren't your donors, but, but, but you're already supporting taxes, huge taxes. Right. Uh, I mean, it's taking what it, it's taking 9% of the income share of income of, of middle class Alaska families, um, taking that out of their pockets. Uh, and, and putting it into government, you're already supporting taxes. The question is, are you if you're going to continue to have government of this size, then then face up to it and 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 develop uh, a revenue approach that equitably distributes the burden across across all income brackets, as opposed to focusing it on on the income brackets that that have the largest adverse impact on the economy but you know to, for for them to for them to say oh we're not going to have taxes we're you know we, we've avoided taxes we've managed to develop you know we're, we're going to constrain government to uh, in a way that we don't have taxes that's just it, it, it's a crock of steadman i mean it's it that's just that's just wrong <laughs> right and you can see it when you pull out you know do the funding chart and show how much is coming from pfd cuts 
Well, and and that's exactly the thing. I mean, they they just don't want to acknowledge it, and and I don't want to. Uh, you know, I don't want to stop the point, you know, to pointing out that we are still spending more per capita than almost any other state in the nation. You know, that our per capita spending is huge. You talked about the dependency, like you said, that previous chart that showed the dependency on all these programs and spending. We've created a welfare state in this, uh, it, it, you know, in, in the state of Alaska and not just welfare in the terms of low income welfare, medic, but corporate welfare and and contractual welfare and everything else. We've got all these different players that are out there saying, oh, we can't stop this government spending because we need it for, you know, for our contracts and for government growth. And I mean, somebody, I, I can't remember, it was last, it was before I went on vacation, so I've already forgotten who it was, but they basically said, oh, look, the only way we're going to grow Alaska's future is with the, is with the, is with this government. We've got to have government because that's the only way the economy is going to grow. And I'm like, if you're looking at the government to grow the economy, you, I mean, first of all, you got to redo your, your, you got to go back through some economic courses because that's not how it works. Uh, but that's what they're looking for. We need to maintain the government spend because that's the only way the economy can grow. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, we, we, we've created, by by overspending in the past, by building all these programs, we create. We've seen it when you know in 2019 when the governor tried to cut them, we've created all these constituencies whose focus in life is to protect their share of of government spending. Uh, you know, be it the, the 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 contractors, be it the 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 people who are dependent on oil and gas tax credits, be it dependent, be it. Uh, you know, the medical community, the hospital community, healthcare community that we've built up in this state, their, their entire focus is protecting their share of government spending. And why? Because the executives don't have to pay for it. They're in the top 20 percent. They've figured out this, this mechanism to push the cost of middle and lower income Alaska families. So it's a, it's a no cost thing for them. Spend more, spend more, spend more. We don't have to pay for it. Push it off on somebody else. Spend more, spend more, spend more. We get the revenue. We don't have to. We don't have to pay the costs. And it's just, it's a system that is 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 self feeding, in the sense that the executives, the top twenty percent, who are benefiting from this system, um, and don't see the cost, just want more of it. I mean, it's the flip side of what people accuse the federal government of, right? Federal government, the, the the flip side, the federal government people say only the top 40 percent pay for government. Right. The remaining 60 percent just want more government. Right. Exactly. And and that's exactly it. Uh, it's just the inverse of that because we're seeing that protectionism in place. All right. Well, <clears throat> that's number one. Give me a 90 second tease here on number two, uh, which is a which is a take on uh, this compromise that we're already seeing the battle lines being drawn. We're already seeing the talking points and the tactics being uh, brought out. Uh, we got a peak of it a little bit ago in the fin Senate Finance Committee, but uh, now it's uh, coming out of the public. Give us a snapshot of this before we go to break. Well, we went through this whole comprehensive working financial, you know, comprehensive financial plan working group to figure out a way forward to have, you know, we had representatives from every caucus. They met, they worked, they came up with a with a plan, uh, a, a way forward that that was a, a, a an agreement, a, a comprehensive uh, approach that uh, that the the four groups uh, agreed on, sort of staked out a balance. Everybody praised them for the work um, uh, that they, that they did. And now we get a uh, an editorial from the chair of the House Ways and Means Committee, which is sort of has sort of been put in charge of figuring out uh, the way forward. And and she, uh, Representative Sponholt, she just sort of throws the comprehensive working group uh, uh, fiscal plan out the out the window, right? Uh, and comes up with one of her own. And so we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about uh, what she said in the editorial and how uh, they're just they're just you know just ignoring. What the what the fiscal working group uh, did in uh, in trying to get a an agreed plan for it is the weekly top three. We just finished up with number one. Got a tease for number two, which is this article, Brad, from Ivy Sponholtz, who is of course the chair of the Ways and Means Committee, 
which, as you pointed out, is the committee that's been delegated in the House side anyway with trying to discover a fiscal solution. The most ironic thing I find in this whole piece uh, is the fact that in uh, one sentence or in one paragraph, she goes on to talk about the uh, the fiscal policy working group and how how they did and they did all this great stuff. And then she immediately discards all that was like, that's great, but here's what we found out. Here's what we want to do. And it's just it's just I would say it's shocking, but it's not really that shocking at this point. Yeah, so let's 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 set the table. We at the end of the what the second special session, we we the the resolution at the end of the se- second special session is we're going to set up this comprehensive uh, uh, fiscal policy working group. It's going to be composed of two members from each of the caucuses. We're going to come together. We're going to try to accomplish uh, uh, what may what what is what has evaded the legislature over 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 the last five years, which is to come up with a fiscal policy working group. And I think I think the general consensus is that, that group, to the surprise of many, did a great job of working out uh, uh, trades and working out uh, uh, different agendas in a way that actually came up with at least a, a sketch of, of a fiscal of a of a working group that could of a of a fiscal policy that could work that could that could achieve consensus that that, that people came together on. One of the key it, it is it is impossible to deny that one of the keys of that of that out of the outcome of that fiscal policy working group was a 50-50 PFD uh, POMV 50-50 POMV PFD. And and it's and and while there was disagreement about how to get there, whether you stair step the Lyman Hoffman approach, or whether you do a a bridge, which is the governor's approach, bridge draw from the from the ERA. The, the while there was disagreement on that, it's impossible to deny that a key focus of of that of that plan that they came up with was a 50-50 POMV. All right, so they came up with it. Lots of effort, lots of lots of lots of discussion, lots of trades, lots of give and take. They came up with the plan. Deliver it to the third special session. House Ways and Means, Ways and Means, uh, is 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 given the charge to all right. Come up with the implementation of that plan. And what does Ways and Means do? They just ignore it. Right. <laughs> It, so, you know, Ivy at the end of the Representative Sponholz at the end of the third special session comes up with what she says is, is you know, the plan that Ways and Means proposes, and it has a 25-75 uh, PFD split. And these are not minor dollars. That is a huge difference in dollars between uh, uh, between 25-75 and, and, and 50-50. She essentially, if you if you if you if you remember this far back, she essentially reverts to the old Jennifer Johnston uh, PFD plan that was the result of the 2019 uh, 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 joint cock, joint body bicameral something uh, fiscal policy working group chaired by uh, 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 Jennifer Johnston. They came, she came up with a 2575 plan. So we've gone from a plan that, that got rejected, the 2019 plan got rejected. We've gone from that to to uh, an agreement to have a comprehensive fiscal policy working group to come up with a plan. They came up with a plan, and now we're right back to where Jennifer Johnson was recommending we be um, in 2019. I I don't. How do you get how do you get to a solution when you when you develop a body to develop a solution? They come up with, to the surprise of many, they come up with a solution. Then you give it to a committee to implement, to find ways to implement that solution, and they just toss it aside. Well, not how only you, that, not how only do you ever get to a solution. Not only that, she ignored it the entire special session. It nothing it never moved. It never really had any discussions on it. Uh, anytime there was a discussion that came up, it immediately went off into the pucker brush on something like this seventy five twenty five and all these other stuff. But that's not that's not all. That's not all she's proposing. She's also proposing uh, again motor fuel tax, education payroll tax, a change to the. A per, I mean, she's you know all these other things, which again in the long run would account for more money for government at the expense of Alaskans. Um, and, and that's just, it's, it's just, it, like I said, I said, I would say it's shocking, but it's not shocking at this point. Well, and the other thing, Michael, all those proposals, motor fuel tax, uh, a payroll tax, none of those really touch the top 20%. People will say a payroll tax does, 
but a payroll tax is focused on wages. And when you get inside the top 20%, a, a significant share of the income of the top 20% is coming from investment income, not coming from wages. So when you look at the distributional uh, effects of a payroll tax, it is fairly low on the, on the low 20%. It is burdensome as heck on the middle uh, 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 income classes, the lower middle, middle and upper middle. Uh, who derive a large share of their income from wages, but when you get to the twenty, the top twenty percent, it goes down again. So it's essentially like a bell curve. Uh, the distributional analysis on a on a payroll tax is essentially like a, a bell curve. It's another way of avoiding putting a burden on the any sort of burden on the top twenty percent. Motor fuel, motor vehicle fuels tax, that's regressive. That hits lower income, middle and lower income Alaska families harder than. Uh, harder than the top 20%. So, I mean, even even in the context, it, it's bad enough that you're doing that by going by proposing 75-25. But even when you propose these these all these alternative revenue sources that yes support uh, uh, sustain larger government, but but are there to help you know at least keep 25% of the PFD. All of those are 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 are, are revenue mechanisms. That 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 push the burden of middle and lower income Alaska families, keep it away from the top twenty percent. So and this is a Democrat. This this is this is someone who you know who who people would say is largely you know a a part from the liberal wing of the the Alaska uh, Democrat uh, uh, legislature, and they're and she's proposing uh, a mechanism which which pushes the burden to middle and lower income Alaska families. It's just it's astonishing. No one. In the legislature, well, this person, this committee is not looking out for middle and lower income Alaska families. The working group did uh, come up with a proposal which would, by going to 50-50 POMB, would, would reduce the burden on, on middle and lower income Alaska families, still keep a burden on them, a cut from statutory uh, PFD levels, uh, but, but at least reduce the burden on middle and lower income Alaska families to some degree. And now, you know, House Ways and Means is just tossing that in the, in the trash heap and, and starting over with their own. It's, it's, we're not going to get to a solution if, if, if we ignore the solution that the body that right. was charged with coming up with the solution but, uh, came up with. Well, and I'll say Chris makes a valid point in the chat room when he says, well, you know, the longer a solution takes, the more money legislators owned by special interests can extract from the permanent fund. Where We know this, right? And that's exactly right. We keep asking ourselves, why do people keep wanting to fight this? Why don't we just get our fiscal house in order? Because the longer it goes, the more money that can be pulled out of the earnings, the more money that can go to these special interests. The, the goal is to get it to flow as long as possible. Maybe Maybe one day it'll stop. Maybe it won't. But the more they delay, the more they do stuff like this, the more money that comes out of uh, uh, the more money that comes out of each uh, uh, each and everybody's pocket before it goes to the to the special interests. That that's a great point. It's it's something I've referred to as the rope dope strategy. That the top twenty percent are are doing a rope dope, right? I mean they they will they will let you know others talk about all sorts of solutions that. Uh, that would make it fairer. That would make the distribution of the burden fairer. That would reduce the the the, the size and scope of government. They'll let them talk all day long about that. But when it when but but this is a great example of it. When push comes to shove, they just throw those they just throw those uh, proposed alternatives out the window and go back to uh, go back to you know something that protects the top twenty yeah. percent. It, it's just it, talk him to death. Give me uh, that's number two. Give me uh, about a ninety second synopsis here on number three, real quick, and then we could finish up in the break. But we're coming up at the top of the hour here. There's some interesting things going on in the L the global LNG market uh, that I think uh, Alaskans should be aware of. Uh, I'm not sh quite sure yet they're significant enough that it changes how people ought to be thinking about Alaska LNG. But uh, but there's some huge changes going on in the global LNG market. Simultaneous with that. Uh, Governor Dunleavy has made an appointment to the L, uh, AKLNG board that is uh, that is uh, hugely interesting. It's a uh, former BP head, uh, Janet Weiss. Uh, the governor has proposed to add to the Gasline board of directors. She brings insights that I don't think the board's had before, um, and and that concurrence with huge changes in the global LNG market uh, may make LNG something that uh, we should be talking about again. I'll explain why uh, when we get to the break. 
it uh, it's interesting to watch. You know, keep looking onto the horizon, Brad, for um, for you know something to save us, right? I mean, that's it's it. back in the Knowles administration during the Murkowski administration, we saw this. You know, this kind of back and forth. If if God, you know, God give us another boom, so we do promise not to piss this one away, kind of thing. And we always ended up getting saved, and now it's looking like that may not be the case. Thirty seconds. Uh, I mean, we've got to cop. St- we got to stop this crisis mindset thing where we always think we're going to be saved by resources. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that, Michael. But but we we do need to be aware of opportunities uh, when they pop up, and and what's going on in the global LNG market is something that we should we should be aware of. Uh, let's talk for a minute here about uh, this appointment of Weiss. Uh, very interesting. I mean, I agree. I think you know this brings a perspective we've never seen. She was obviously on the outside looking in during the Walker administration, uh, trying to when Walker was pushing hard for a state owned LNG thing. Um, and, but I think I think she brings some some reality to what's going on. What what are the pros and cons from your perspective? Well, I think she has huge insights into how the private sector thinks about LNG projects um, uh, and uh, and huge insights into into what it would take to bring an LNG uh uh, project together, but but let me set the context for that a little bit. Um, LNG prices, uh, global LNG prices, have for the past several years been running in the six to seven dollar range, and the Alaska project has been uh, sort of put on the shelf because its costs, uh, uh, even even if you accept that we can grind down the costs as much as uh, as much as the as the project is proposed, our costs are still in the seven dollar range. So uh, we really we, we we were not in a position to to move forward because of the because of the economics. But in the last year, uh, LNG prices have been steadily rising. We do a uh, I do a, a, an analysis every Monday that we post on the page about uh, global LNG prices. and the and the December, the futures market LNG price, uh, right now for December uh, 2021 is $24.87 uh, to Asia, $22.50 uh, to Europe. Um, it, it goes down from there. It's $13 in Asia. It's $13.50 in 20, December 2022, $9.93 in 2023, um, $8 in 2024. So it's it's in backwardation. It's it's saying that 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 the market thinks the price is going to uh, go down substantially uh, uh, at, uh, over over time, but there are forces at work that's driving that that very high price currently. That that twenty essentially a twenty five dollar per MMBTU price currently that may be uh, persistent. What's going What's going on is as we have commitments on the global side to shut down coal plants to curtail. Uh, 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 coal, uh, electricity production from coal, um, as we have uh, curtailments of nuclear plants because of concerns about nuclear plants, um, and and an increased reliance on renewables, uh, turns out uh, sometimes the wind doesn't blow. Right now, uh, Britain is facing a a, a very uh, difficult situation in terms of rising uh, LNG prices because of, of the fact that They've had a, a lower wind, lower renewable generation from wind than uh, right. than they anticipated, um, and so we're, we're the 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 globe is sh- is slowly shifting into an environment where it is dependent uh, on on additional gas production. Now, part of the problem with uh, with the LNG price is supply. We've had some unreliability on some on some LNG plants that they expected to run at higher. Uh, rates of reliability that haven't, and so there's some supply uh, interruptions that maybe go away. Uh, but over the longer term, as we as the as as governments shift to more and more uh, 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 push away more and more from coal, push away more and more from nuclear, depend more and more uh, on LNG, we may find that that this development, this development of higher LNG prices has a longer persistence than simply uh, a price spike in a given year. We went through a price spike uh, last year as well, and people sort of dismissed it, saying that was a one-off. Now we're going into, in the immediately follow, immediate following year, we're going into another one. So I think there's, I think there's a global, a, a, a change in the, in the global LNG markets that's worth noticing. 
simultaneously having somebody like Janet Weiss um, uh, with with her experience at BP, her experience uh, on the private side, private sector looking at LNG projects, having her accept a position on L on uh, on the LNG board. I mean, she wouldn't do it. You wouldn't think if she didn't think that there was something to be done there. Um, having her accept a position on the on the AK LNG board. Um, it, 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 I, I'm not saying that this is the, we found the solution. By God, we're going to be saved by LNG. But I am saying that it's it, we shouldn't be ignoring the changes that are going on, potentially going on in the global market. And we've got a person on the AK LNG board that has uh, has has a deep history on the private side, uh, and uh, and has uh, the experience, I think, to be able to identify a path forward to take to take. Uh, 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 the, uh, these opportunities and do something with them if, in fact, the opportunities are there. I hope so. I mean, I hope she brings that perspective that we're, you know, that we need uh, from that outsider's perspective, this idea that somehow government can do it. Uh, we all know that that <clears throat> government usually just screws it up and then triples the cost all at the same time. So uh, hopefully uh, she can bring some of that perspective that we need to the situation. Uh, one final uh, one final thought, uh, Brad. You've seen the announcement, Bill Walker. It's a who's who of uh, bigger <laughs> government. Um, I mean, his 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 treasury, you know, his all his uh, his honorary treasurers and everything else. Bill Walker coming in. I got about 45 seconds here. Give me your thoughts on Bill Walker announcing he's running for governor again. Oh, it's summed up in one word, Kathy Geisel. I mean, Kathy Geisel has endorsed Bill Walker for governor. That tells you all you need to know, which is that Bill Walker hasn't changed from the governor that cut the PFD. Bill Walker hasn't changed from the governor that continued to, you know, say that we couldn't that we couldn't cut government. Kathy Geisel, who was is probably the biggest disappointment uh, uh, in the legislature, maybe in the history of the legislature, but certainly in the last ten years, Kathy Geisel's bought into Bill Walker. That tell that just seeing her name on that list told me all that I need to know about where this is going. So, yeah, he's running. Yeah, he's got a lot of support. Um, a lot of top 20 percent, a lot of uh, government uh, union uh, support. They want to keep the they want to keep the party going. Yep. Brad, thank you so much, my friend. We'll talk to you again soon. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keith, late Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.